Okay, so when we're looking at the difference between completing karma and I guess our approach to practices with long life, we have to understand that we don't actually know how long this particular lifespan was projected to be at our birth. Okay, so we might have had a lifespan that was projected for 80 years or 90 years or 100 years, but if it was projected for only 65 years, there's no amount of prayers that are going to add on years. Yeah, we can't add on any years because part of our lifespan is related to our, our projecting karma. Yeah, and our completing karma is our experiences during that life. Projecting karma this life itself, this body, how long it's going to live, the completing karma, our experience during this life. So what do we want during this life? We want health, right? So say you have the lifespan of 80 years. Do you want to be sick for 80 years or do you want to be healthy for 80 years? Mm -hmm. And those sort of things are conditions that we can play with. Yeah. Which is why we do practices like that to try and really bring as many supportive conditions to this life as we can. It could be that we have the karma for untimely death, right? Be hit by a bus, random illness, etc. right? We might have untimely death karma. And that's the kind of karma that can often be cleared by strong practice. Okay, so you have, you know, your lifespan of 80 years, but also you have a big obstacle year, maybe when you're 68 or something like that, a big obstacle year, you can clear the obstacle year through practices like this. So, you know, it's a delicate thing because, you know, we're wanting this long life, but we don't really know how long it can be. Why do we want a long life? Yeah, is long life in and of itself a good thing? Divorce from context? Have you been to a nursing home lately? <laughs> is it always good to live long? So living long, why? Living long in order to practice the spiritual path, right? living long in order to build and nourish our relationships with our friends and family in the deepest way, living long in order to deepen our heart connection with altruism so that it's such a strong habit that it will kick in in our next life. Yeah, because we really don't want to waste the work that we've done in this life. We've put in so much time and energy, learned our life lessons, had our struggles, had our relationship issues, had our workplace issues, learned about communication and intimacy and love and meaning and purpose. And then we might just forget it all if we're reborn as a dog and we're a dog for 20 years. Yeah, we might be a really sweet dog for 20 years, but you're gonna forget a lot. Like how much do you forget from last year? You know, so we wanna really maximize the way this mental continuum goes and have back to back perfect human rebirths. Yeah, back to back perfect human rebirths or be reborn in a pure land, which is like a university paradise <laughs> where we can become enlightened very quickly. So when you're doing these practices, think it's not just that I want a long life just because I don't want the fun to end <laughs> or just because I'm afraid of death. Yeah, the reason for a long life is so that I can continue my spiritual path. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just kind of like sit with that. It's in order to continue my spiritual path. And also, I can't add to my life, but I can purify obstacles to living it out. Yeah, I can purify obstacles. So often white Tara practices are also done in conjunction with long life pujas for our lamas, yeah, for our gurus. And that's always an interesting question because you think, why are we asking the guru to live long? Don't they get to decide if they've gone beyond karma or if they're enlightened or nearly enlightened? Couldn't they just say, this time I shall be 90. <laughs> why do we need to ask them? <laughs> And the reason why we ask the teachers to live long is to create the cause for them to live long. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because their lifespan, in terms of our connection to it, is based very much on our karma. Yeah, the Buddhas would be in human form around us constantly cheering like a cheerleader squad, giving us every single teaching we ever needed exactly when we needed it all the time, if they could but they can't because of our karma. Yeah, we have obstacles 
to receiving the love, compassion, and wisdom that is constantly being flooding us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They want nothing but our welfare at all times in all ways, but it can't get to us all the time because of our own obstacles. So we'll do a long life puja and long life prayers for our teachers in order to create the cause to stay connected to them, in order to create the cause for them to show the aspect of long life. Does that make sense? Yeah. So there's a lot of reasons to do long life practices. And you can also do these practices on behalf of someone you have a close karmic connection with. So you might have pretty good health yourself. You might be fairly young. Of course, we could all be hit by a truck, you know, just walking out the door. So, you know, young people die before old people every day. Sick people live longer than healthy people all the time. You know, life's not tidy, but it might be that there's someone in your life who's really struggling. You know, someone in your life with a terminal illness, someone in your life with a mental health crisis, someone in your life just struggling. And can we transfer our good karma to someone else? No, 100% no. But can we be an incredibly powerful condition to ripen their karma? Yes. So this is the thing. We cannot be a substantial cause for someone else, but we can be a condition. We can be an incredibly powerful condition if we have a strong relationship with them already, even a bad relationship already, if it's just strong, right? It's the strength that dictates the connection. Yeah. So you could actually be of great benefit to your worst enemy if you're very close connection with them. You know, if they don't like you, you don't like them, but you're doing lots of practice on their behalf, it could go really well for them. Yeah. 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 And it might help things in the future between you too. So there's, there's, you know, yeah, exactly. Right. So, so kind of like have that in the back of your mind of when you do long life practices and health practices and Tonglen giving and taking practices for someone, you're not fixing them you're not transferring karma to them. You're an incredibly powerful condition for them to ripen their positive karma. Whether or not their positive karma ripens or not is up to them, their receptivity. So keep remembering just the basic things you know about life. If you love someone deeply, do they always feel it? No. You could love them with your whole heart and they don't necessarily feel it if they're in a very blocked space. If they're feeling a lot of self-loathing or self-contempt or alienation and isolation from humanity, they can't feel that you love them because they're blocked to it. Yeah, you could flood them with your best work, it wouldn't go in. So the Buddhas are flooding us with their best work, but it's not always going in. Yeah, so, you know, they are conditions, we are conditions, conditions, conditions. Substantial causes are personal and specific. Yeah, which is not to diminish their importance, but it can help us be less focused on outcomes and have less pressure to fix things because it's really not up to us. All we are is one condition amongst many. Yeah, and we can be a really significant one for good or bad, but we're not the cause of anything except for our own mental experience. Yeah. Do you guys have any questions so far or thoughts coming up? Yeah, Christina, please. This is gonna sound like a very selfish question um, because it is. <laughs> uh, if you, I imagine that if you're praying for somebody else uh, during a like Tara retreat, it doesn't mean that like you're giving all the those uh, benefit and all those prayers to to that person you're also still receiving right and so with that context if it's true <laughs> if that's true does that also mean that then you could also pray for everybody and and it doesn't diminish uh anybody's um that condition mm. uh that you're talking about that you could really ripen that digit i mean not that I would be that powerful of a holy being to be able to do that. But then you could mm. literally pray for all beings in that way. Yeah, absolutely. Without diminishing your own. That's the selfish yeah, part. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the practice is going to help you first and foremost. 
So even if you're praying and practicing for someone else on their behalf, wanting to be a powerful condition, it's like you have no choice, but it also benefiting you because you're the one doing it. Yeah. So hundred um, percent. If you're doing it with the, um, a, like a performative aspect, like here I am being a good person doing a puja for someone, then of course your own benefit is somewhat diminished, right? Um, your motivation is key. And you know, so that, that's the one piece, but certainly if you're practicing for other people, it's not like you escape also being benefited yourself. Yeah, for sure. And I think that there's, there's a lot to be said for having confidence and faith in intention, because some of these parts of the practice that we're going to go through in a second, some of it makes sense right away, no problem. And some of it is really foreign to us. And we're like, what is these Sanskrit words? What is this visualization doing? What is happening right now? And if you have conviction that it's a recipe for powerful conditions, some of which you understand, some of which you don't, but you have conviction in the process because you know the Buddhas are valid beings. Yeah, and you know that the Buddhas are valid beings from your own experience of practicing Dharma on the sutra level, like if I practice patience, it helps my anger be less. Mm. And you've tried that and it worked. So you have faith based in conviction and reason, not blind faith. And you've read things about logic and you've read things about the mind and they ring true logically. They ring true experientially. So then when you come across Tantra teachings that are a little bit more esoteric, you have confidence that it's going the right direction because so far the Dharma has not lied to you. Do you know what I mean? So you have enough pieces where that makes sense to kind of like hang some grips on, but there's also some pieces that will take a while to unpack and need commentary. But even before you understand them, they have power. And the biggest one, of course, is the mantra itself. Om Tare, Tutare Ture, Mama Ayu Punyam Jana, Pushtim Kurie Soha. The white Tara mantra, it's a mouthful. It's Sanskrit, then it's Tibetan accented Sanskrit, and then it's American accented Tibetan Sanskrit, <laughs> right? And then it's my perfect, uh, imperfect understanding of that coming through to you, and then you taking it on with your imperfect inter un misunderstandings, right? And it's like, what? the intention comes through, right? The intention comes through. So you could be saying, I love dishwashing soap, random something. But if you had absolute conviction that these are the words of white Tara, it would work, okay? Um, and there's many stories from Sutra and Tantra about this. So you do your best and you do your best to mimic whoever taught you. But then when you get the empowerment from a Lama, try and say it the way they said it even though Tibetan teachers will say benza instead of vajra, and you're like, what? <laughs> All right. Um, just do it in the way that your teachers teach you and be flexible and have confidence that these are sacred sounds that resonate within your energy system and are very effective, but not from their own side divorced from context. They're powerful because of the beings who created them, and then they're powerful because of you connecting to them. And those two things have to come together. Yeah. So just really gently relax into it. And the parts that don't make sense, make a mental note. You know, you don't have to pretend they do make sense or stuff your doubt or stuff your uneasiness. Make a mental note to check um, and ask your teachers. And there's some fantastic commentaries out there that you can come back to. And I'll explain quite a lot this weekend. And you can ask questions as well, but just really gently, gently. So with Kriya Tantra, which is the class of Tantra that White Tara belongs to, Kriya Tantra means action Tantra. And it's the lowest form of Tantra. And the lower forms of Tantra are pretty much all for health and long life. And even if they're um, more implicitly, yeah. So they could be explicitly about health, like Medicine Buddha, and then also be a little bit of long life. White Tara is explicitly about long life, but a little bit about health. Orange Manjushri doesn't really talk about health or long life particularly, but it's implied underneath. The whole point of doing action tantra is to have a long enough life to practice highest yoga tantra. Yeah. 
<laughs> so, you know, there's, there's two intermediate tantras that we usually jump right over in the Tibetan tradition. More on that if it's important, but lower tantra gets you used to how sadhanas work. And then you can build on that knowledge into highest yoga tantra. And highest yoga tantra is using much more problematic negative emotions on the path, right? So something like anger, which is usually destructive, which is completely, I guess, something that we focus on antidoting aggressively on the sutra path. In highest yoga tantra, you're taking the energy of that and removing the afflictive quality and turning it towards loving kindness and compassion. So the most powerful anger becomes the most powerful love and compassion. It might have a wrathful aspect to intimidate the negative states of mind of sentient beings, but not to dominate the sentient being themselves, not to hurt the sentient being themselves, but to kind of like wilt their afflictions so their best sides come out. But that is a very dangerous, delicate process. And you want to not just jump into it. You want to start really gentle and small with just how are sadhanas or practice manuals? How are they built? How are they structured? And every deity is slightly different, but you'll start to see repetition. That deity to deity, there's some key features that get repeated and you get used to the fact that they're all built quite a similar way. Yeah. So lower Tantra, you are also transforming things like attachment and aversion, and you're not transforming something bad into something good. You're transforming uh, an energy from an afflicted side to a transformed side. You can't change an affliction into a virtue, but you can change the energetic quality underneath. So the, the affliction still needs to be addressed with things like, you know, patience or loving kindness or whatever it is and transformed into loving kindness, compassion, wisdom, whatever it is. But the rumbling of like craving, grasping desire that's like hungry can be transformed into something expansive. Mm, that's goodness. Right. And the, and the anger that's like, get away, get away. I must defend. I must punish. I must whatever fight, flight, fright, flight. Mm fight, freeze, fawn, all the things, right? All the trauma responses, all transformable energies, but the neuroses can't be made good. You have to address the neuroses. Yeah, so, so you know, sometimes we use a shorthand in Tantra, like we're transforming negative emotions. Now we're transforming the energy that accompanies them. The negative emotions are still being addressed in the same sutra way that you've been used to. Yeah. So gently, gently, but on the Kriya Tantra level, we're using the amount of attachment, aversion, and ignorance that arises just by looking. Yeah, and as the Tantras progress, you get closer and closer to the object that triggers it. Yeah, hence the iconography. Yeah, hence the iconography being the deities getting closer and closer or scarier and scarier. You know, um, the Kriya Tantra Manjushri is just got a little sword, but a sweet little smile. Yeah, sweet little smile, you know, 16 year old boy. Yeah, Manjushri. <laughs> and, um, you know, he, he's like a little scary because he's got a sword, but then you're like, all right, but it's the sword of wisdom cutting through ignorance. That's nice. Yeah, I like that. But then you see Yamantaka, which is the highest yoga tantra version of Manjushri, and he's holding severed heads. He's got a machete. Like you're like, whoa, all right, that's a lot, Buddhists. That's unexpected. I thought you were love and light, you know, like what? Yeah. And it's variations on a theme. And of course, Yamantaka is not pillaging villages and cutting off heads. It's all symbolic, but the appearance gets more and more intense. Yeah. And so if you see these, you know, wrathful deities or um, desirous deities, it's symbolic of the amount of afflictive energy that you're trying to work with. Yeah. So anyway, it's not a permission to have orgies or to go kill villagers or I don't know, to <laughs> no weapons of mass destruction on the tantric path. Okay. So that said, Kriya Tantra is where we're at. So if you think about delicious chocolate, okay, delicious chocolate or delicious something if you don't like chocolate, think of it just in front of you, unwrapped, but you're not touching it and you're not eating it, but you're like, I would like that chocolate. Mm, I can feel craving arise. 
Yeah, can you kind of like imagine that amount of attachment? Like, mm, there's some on the altar right now. Not an accident. Hershey kisses, just so you know. <laughs> Okay, and like beautiful flowers. You're like, oh, I love those beautiful flowers. I just want to stick my nose right in them and just go, roses. Yeah, these are attachment objects. They're there on purpose to make you have attachment and then transform the energy of it and then move on from your attachment and then still enjoy it, right? So then you can put your nose in the roses. Then you can eat the chocolate, but you're giving yourself some delay to let go of the exaggeration that attachment says. Mm. Attachment says, if you stick your nose in those roses, if you gobble all that chocolate, you will be happy. And you will be happy for a second, mm -hmm. but not long-term. Because mm -hmm. that's the lie of attachment. It says, this thing gives you happiness from its own side, which would mean no matter how long you kept your nose in the flowers, it would continue to give you joy. And after a while, you would sneeze and be like, enough with the roses already, Ugh, too much. Yeah, and if you ate one chocolate, yay, but the whole bag, little sick feeling. So if they were the happiness that they say they are, or they seem to say they are, they would always work. You know that that's not true. That's attachment lying to you. So you break the spell and then you can enjoy it. And that's a lot of Tantra is break the spell of attachment, break the spell of anger, break the spell of ignorance. And then you can engage with these objects in an enjoyment way that's not afflicted. You can have bliss without craving. Yeah. So these are just some Tantra psychology ideas to understand about, but you'll find a lot of offerings in Tantric practices. Like here we're offering water, here we're offering incense. These are all things that your senses like, yeah? Your senses like to drink water and it's healthy and good for you. Your senses love a bath, yeah? Long shower, long bath, you love that, right? It's great, yeah? Um, if you don't, that's fine, it's symbolic, right? But you know, the reason why we have the offerings on the altar that we do are because there are things we like and get attached to, yeah? We release our attachment to them and offer them and then they come back to us anyway. Yeah. And now they're all kind of cleaned up. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna show you the sadhana a little bit and, um, and then we'll have a tea break and actually do the sadhana. All right, so if you wanna look on page three, where it says the sadhana of Chinta Chakra, White Tara. So that's the Sanskrit name. The, Tibetan name for white Tara is Drilka. So up at the top of page three, it says homage to Arya Tara, the wish fulfilling wheel, the mother who gives birth to the Buddhas of the three times, just by remembering you bestows all attainments. And you think, wow, that's, you're really selling it there. Yeah, okay, great. <laughs> um, but what it actually means is the mother who gives birth to the Buddhas that means the wisdom that people access to cut the root of samsara, mm -hmm. to then go on to develop the qualities to complete enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. Oh. Yeah, so the mother in this instance, the mother is emptiness. Yeah, whenever you hear mother giving birth in a tantric context, it's like uh, the space of infinite possibility that is womb-like, where you know life comes from the womb, right? The space of the womb is where create where kind of creation flows forth from. Mm -hmm. So whenever you see like the mother of this and the mother of that, that's what's being referred to in the tantric context is the wisdom realizing emptiness. Yeah. And sometimes it's referring to emptiness itself. Yeah. But when you say emptiness itself, you're not saying nothingness. You're saying the fact that things lack inherent existence means they can change. If things were inherently existent, we couldn't become Buddhas. We couldn't even become better people. We would just be stuck as we are forever. Yeah. So there's kind of two ways to read mother. Mother in the sense of emptiness itself, where all possibility flows forth from, and mother in the sense of the wisdom realizing that. So she could be the wisdom or she could be the emptiness, but um, both are in this kind of like mother aspect, feminine aspect. 
So we remember that Buddhas are genderless and genderful, right? Mm. All Buddhas are genderless and genderful. Buddhas do not need to have a gender. They take the aspect of having a gender for a specific purpose for our mind. Just like she's white and Medicine Buddha is blue and Manjushri is orange. These are all intentional and they all are trying to do something for our mind. Mm. So it's a little bit like there, if you go to a different country and you listen to a stand-up comedian, you might not get any of the jokes because you don't know the culture. Mm -hmm. And then if you're in the culture long enough, the jokes start to be funny. Yeah, this happened to me in Australia where initially I had no idea about Australian humor. I was like, what? You guys, what? And then years went by and it got funnier and funnier because I understood the context. Mm -hmm right? The Buddhas are similar. It's like for some of us, we need sweet and feminine and peaceful and flowery. Sometimes we need wrathful. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we need this aspect and that aspect. Mm -hmm. And it's based on what we need in our context, in our conditioning, what's going to resonate for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So she's taking a feminine aspect, 16 year old in like um, perfect vitality, perfect strength, you know, kind of like at the height of her beauty, conventionally speaking. And whether you're a man or a woman or non-binary or anything related to gender doesn't matter in your relationship to her. Mm. Yeah, you're connecting with her and her is important because of this mother aspect, mm. emptiness and the wisdom realizing emptiness, because that's a lot of what's being emphasized in this practice. Yeah. And when we actually have the empowerment, when we have the empowerment, we're allowed, we're permitted to see ourselves as the deity. Mm. Yeah. And you yourself arise as white Tara, whether you're a 16 year old girl or not. And none of us in the room are 16 year old girls. None of us. Right. We, and we have not been for quite some time. There's a part of you. You know, <laughs> right. And the thing is, it's like part of the power of Tantra is overcoming ordinary appearance and grasping. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes people will say, I don't want to identify as a 16 year old girl or a 16 year old boy. And, and then I'm like, well, do you want to identify as Yamantaka? He's a buffalo. So that's a whole other <laughs> kettle of fish, right? He's a male buffalo, if that helps. I don't know. But, you know, like, who cares? Right. And it's, it's really about overcoming ordinary appearance mm -hmm. and grasping. Mm -hmm. Because this body that you so identify with is so new to the experience of your mental continuum. How many bodies have you had and discarded and had and discarded over time? So many bodies, yeah, over time. So why are you saying this one is me and its anatomical features are me and the gender that I was assigned at birth is me? That's all just kind of new. Live in that space, acknowledge your socialization, acknowledge how you were brought up, acknowledge the habits in your mind of how you express your own gender or your own feelings about, I don't know, strength or feminine or, you know, masculine, like let yourself acknowledge your own habits and what feels like you, you know, you might be a manly man, you might be a lady's lady, you might be anything in between, but it's not really you, it's just a habit and socialization. Yeah, it's a social construct. And you know that if you've studied any kind of sociology or been around Generation Z for any period of time, right? They're all about, oh, gender is a construct, right? They're right, it is. <laughs> but we can still say, merely labeled, I'm a woman, that's fine. That can just live there, no big deal. But then if you're you know, doing a practice where you're then identifying as a man, it doesn't have to give you an identity crisis. In fact, it should help you let go of ordinary appearance and grasping. So it's good for us to have a few empowerments with different kinds of deities. Mm. Yeah, some peaceful, some wrathful, mm. some masculine, some feminine, some more human looking, some less human looking. It's useful for cracking our identification. Mm. So don't think that uh, when you get into highest yoga tantra, if you're a woman, you can only take Vajrayogini. And if you're a man, you can only take Haruka. That is completely missing the point. Mm. Yeah. Because eventually we're going to balance and integrate and utilize our own masculine and feminine energies, mm. our own wrathful and peaceful energies. And all of these things will become tools to benefit sentient beings. 
And when you see someone like His Holiness the Dalai Lama, who we think of as enlightened, you know, who can say we can't take another person's measure, but His Holiness seems to be enlightened. Do you notice that sometimes he seems young, mm. sometimes he seems old, mm -hmm. sometimes he seems very maternal and motherly and sweet, and sometimes he seems very masculine and powerful and strong. He just shifts it, whatever is needed for the audience in front of him. He's got this flexibility. His face can look a million different ways, even though his face stays generally kind of pleasantly neutral. And this is kind of showing us what we as human beings can work towards mm -hmm. is I'm going to just kind of be in whatever is going to be of most benefit to sentient beings and not in a enabling way, not in a codependent way, but in an empowered way that is really conscious of the big picture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and your own part in it. Mm -hmm. So Tantra is incredibly powerful. And for those of you that have white Tara empowerment, see yourself as white Tara today. For those of you that don't have white Tara empowerment, try and have the sense of her with you all day, even in between sessions. So whether you feel like she's with you sitting on the crown of your head, or she's with you gently in front of you, try and just hold the awareness of her being present all day. Yeah, and that's a really good way to get into retreat mindset. Yeah. So even you're making a cup of tea, you're going to the bathroom, you're doing whatever, you're just holding the awareness of white Tara-ness there to benefit you and bring you closer to her enlightened state. Yeah. And coming closer to the deity really eventually means merging with and becoming. And that is really a potentiality within us all, but it requires intentional repetition. Yeah. Okay. So Going back to the sadhana, um, the three times just refers to past, present, and future. So homage to Tara, Arya Tara, meaning she's realized emptiness directly. The wish fulfilling wheel, more on that later. The mother, wisdom realizing emptiness and emptiness itself. That quality is what gives birth to the enlightened mind or to the Buddhas of the past, present, and future, the three times. Remembering you, means remembering that, remembering that bestows all attainments, not like they were planted on you, but they're coming from within you by remembering that. Yeah. Can you say that one more time? Remembering you means? So remembering you re means remembering Arya Tara, the mother of all Buddhas, right? Remembering emptiness and the wisdom realizing emptiness uh -huh. is what's going to give us attainments okay, okay. or realizations. Yeah. So it sounds like she's giving them to you, right? That she's bestowing them on you, right. but they're actually coming from you by remembering this potentiality. Okay. So a lot of the, the vocabulary sounds like, please save me, please fix me, please give me. And really that is not what's being said and it's easy to misunderstand. You're really awakening those things within yourself. You already have white Tara-ness. It's just kind of in its less matured state and you're maturing it. Yeah. So here I put down this sadhana in concise form. I is Trijong Rinpoche. Here, Trijong Rinpoche was the author of this particular sadhana. Um, and he was one of the tutors of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, very important enlightened being. And in a concise form means this is the short version. There's a very long version as well. Um, those who wish to practice the sadhana of Chinta Chakra, White Tara, should arrange the offerings in Torma properly and with special and virtuous state of mind should visualize the objects of refuge. So this little section, you don't need to read every time. This is just kind of your context, yeah. And the offerings, really they can just be, let's see, I think there's even a picture of them somewhere, very logical. Let's see, there they are. Okay, so on the um, bottom of page four, you see a little picture. Yeah, so you've got um, water for drinking, water for washing, flowers, incense, light, perfume, food, and music. And those are the offerings to have on the altar, or you can just have water. Yeah, just water is fine because water is precious and pure and very important. So if you don't have all this, you can just do water. And then it's nice to add what's called a torma, 
which is a food offering. So um, today we've chosen um, Hershey's Kisses just for your own context. Those are the torma of today. But really when you're doing offerings, it's mainly about the visualization, but in lower Tantra, Kriya Tantra, the physical expression is more emphasized. Mm. The higher into the Tantras you go, the more visualized things become. Mm -hmm. So in lower tantra, like Kriya Tantra, but also like Nungne's um, Chen Rezig practice, the, the physical behaviors are more important than they are as you go more subtle. So sometimes there'll be the request that people don't have black foods, like eggs, like garlic, these kinds of things, because they disturb the inner energy system, they kind of wake it up, like garlic generally, very good for your heart, but garlic when you're doing Kriya Tantra gets you a little overstimulated. Mm -hmm. Eggs, generally good, protein is good, you know, free range, organic, all the things, you know, okay, be good, but um, Eggs are good, but they also can do interesting things with your digestion, if you think back to your last few egg experiences. Okay, so for the sake of your fellow retreaters and your inner energy system, no eggs today. Okay, <laughs> if you had eggs this morning, what can you do but no more eggs today if you can avoid them. <laughs> Right, so these quote black foods, they're not bad in and of themselves. It's that you're wanting to kind of quiet your energy system and get it into balance. And those very same foods can become very useful foods when you practice highest yoga tantra. So it's all context, okay? So we're, you know, we're doing kind of outer cleanliness, you know, really a lot of hand washing, a lot of bathing, a lot of avoiding black foods and having the actual offerings out rather than just visualizing them. Don't worry if you don't have them, these are there on your behalf, but you know, it kind of gets more and more subtle as the tantras progress. Yeah. Okay. And then one more little bit and then we'll have a break. Okay, so back to the top. So let's see, there you go. Those who wish to practice the sadhana, we're still on page three, should arrange the offerings in Torma properly. And then with a special and virtuous state of mind should visualize the objects of refuge. So he, before you do the actual refuge prayer, just take a minute and visualize. Okay, so this is what's being said here. So when you're doing this at home, you can kind of skip through this first part, but just make sure, check, you got some offerings, even if it's just a flower from your garden, even if it's just an apple from your fridge that's all clean and nice, it doesn't have to be fancy. Um, then visualize the objects of refuge. With all deity practices, there's a whole merit field, but really just Tara herself is enough. So visualize Tara in the space in front. And when you visualize her, you want to think about her in a specific way. She's, she's radiant white made of transparent light, having like the ability to move, like maybe her scarves are moving as if there was a light breeze. Mm. She should feel real, three-dimensional and made of light. Mm. And she's white, not Caucasian. She's white, white. She's white like the moon white, yeah. And so you're kind of, you know, steadying the visualization. She's got one face, two arms. She has an eye in her palms and an eye on the soles of her feet and a third eye between her two eyes. More on symbolism later. We'll do a whole symbolism chat later. But just kind of like be with her being there. And she's seated on a lotus, a sun disc, and a moon disc. And the lotus represents renunciation the determination to be free from samsara. Mm -hmm. The sun disk represents um, the wisdom realizing emptiness. The moon disk represents bodhicitta. Mm -hmm. So these three are in every single deity. You're looking around and there's a lotus, sun and moon disk on all of them. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it looks like there's only one disk because the other one is a little bit too skinny or it's implied, mm -hmm. but it's always renunciation, the determination to be free the wisdom realizing emptiness, and the mind of enlightenment, mm. bodhicitta, always those three. Those are the three principal aspects of the path. And whenever you practice Tantra, never divorce your mind from those, or you go to crazy town, right? You go off the deep end, you go into 
problems with ethics, you go into problems with reality, mixing relative truth and ultimate truth in the wrong way and getting yourself all confused. Or you might forget about working for the welfare of sentient beings is the whole reason to start using these difficult energies. Yeah, the whole reason for Tantra is in order to become enlightened for others. If you don't wanna become enlightened for sentient beings, do not practice Tantra. Yeah, it's not for you if it's not for others. Yeah. So that's the part of the symbolism I want to talk about right now is just those three principal aspects of the path that are symbolized there are incredibly important. So in Kriya Tantra, usually you'll see them on a moon disc as the most uh, close to their knees and bum and stuff. That's the one that's the up. And in highest yoga Tantra, the sun disc is often the one that's up. So you'll see, you know, sometimes standing on yellowish goldish, sometimes standing on, on whitish, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's not accidental either. It's showing what this particular deity emphasizes. Mm -hmm. So because she's closest to the moon, she's closest to emphasizing bodhicitta. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the main emphasis and the rest are implied. Mm -hmm. They're implicit, they're still there, but the mind of enlightenment bodhicitta is closest to what's being emphasized because it's closest to her actual body yeah and let's see and then so you're thinking about her you're sitting with her she's right there in front of you if you're not a visualizer don't worry right it can just be mm -hmm. simple white light that gradually clarifies into features um one way to think about visualization is to remember how easy it is to visualize things that are familiar and have no pressure. So if you think about your cutlery drawer in your kitchen right now, you probably have a fair amount of detail. Yeah, your spoons are here and your forks are here and your knives are here and I don't know, your chopsticks and a random knife and then some I don't know, rubber bands. I don't know what your drawers are like, but you, you know, there's a fair amount of detail you can kind of picture in your mind's eye if you think about your cutlery drawer. Do you agree? Yeah, fair amount of detail. Why? Because you see it every day. Yeah, and you also don't have any pressure on your mind to remember it. So you're not squeezing your mind and going, remember the spoons, you know, there's no pressure. When you're visualizing something like White Tara, you've probably seen pictures of White Tara a hundred times or more, just walking around Buddhist centers, going to gompas. You might have one in your house and then you try to visualize and it's like you've never seen her before because you're putting too much pressure on your mind. Yeah, so see her like you're seeing an old friend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you just, okay, start with white, one face, two arms, beautiful smile. It helps to pick an image of her that you have an affinity with, because of course there's a million images of her. So choose someone's artistic depiction that resonates for you as your go-to, but you know, just really gentle. And sometimes you can do a trick where you can imagine something ordinary like your kitchen counter and then imagine her sitting on your kitchen counter. Yeah, without closing your eyes just right now like imagine her sitting on your kitchen counter and she's kind of like, you could do the dishes. No, but um, she's sitting there on your kitchen counter. Mm -hmm. And it somehow makes it less scary or less intimidating, because you're not all formally in your posture, you're not squeezing your mind you're just there she is sitting in my kitchen counter and then get rid of the kitchen. Yeah, so you get her stabilized in your mind's eye and then get rid of the kitchen and just leave her there. Yeah. So there's a lot of tricks like this, but don't psych yourself out by not being able to visualize it comes over time. And there are, of course, a few people with the word I can't pronounce. What is it? Aphantasia, aphantasia, whatever that disorder is where you can't visualize. There's a small percentage of the population who just can't visualize. Don't even worry. The, mo the most important thing is to think that she's there. Because she was already. Mm -hmm. She was already before you visualized her. It's just by bringing intention to it, you make your receptivity more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're not inviting her from anywhere. She's already here. Mm -hmm. But by visualizing her or just thinking she's here, mm -hmm. it's like you're opening up the pathway. You're building the bridge. Yeah. So the, once you have whatever quality of visualization or impression you have of her, mm -hmm. then you want to mix that with your relationship with your guru. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
so your guru, your root guru, if you don't have a root guru, you can think about His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, but you're mixing that appearance with your relationship with the teacher so that it feels more personal and direct. It's almost like your teacher is wearing a white Tara suit, you know? But, you know, she is there embodying all the things she embodies, but she's one in nature with your root guru. Yeah, so those are the thoughts to have while visualizing. She is there, she's present. I'll see her as well as I can, but I won't worry about it. She's one in nature with my root guru. Yeah, and you just kind of right there, looking at you, kind gaze, compassionate gaze. She's simultaneously aware of all sentient things, but she's there, she's there for you. And then you do the prayer. Yeah, then you do the prayer. So then you would say the prayer and the prayer is pretty straightforward. And then you do the generation of the mind of enlightenment. So you're reviving your mind of enlightenment and this is just the bottom of page three. And then on page four, we get into blessing the offerings and the blessing the offerings section. You only literally bless the offerings if you have the empowerment. If you don't have the empowerment, you just imagine this is being done on your behalf. Yeah. And um, the most important thing really for whether you have the empowerment or not is to think about emptiness here. So the Om Solava Shuddha Sawadama Solava Shuddha Hum, that mantra is to remind you that all things are by nature empty of inherent existence, particularly these offerings you're about to do. So that helps you not have the wrong ideas about the offerings. And you think then out of emptiness, eight little ohms appear. And from those ohms appear spacious, extensive jeweled vessels. Yeah, so just really beautiful dishes, really beautiful. Yeah. And inside of which little ohms appear. And then they transform into water for drinking, water for washing flowers, incense, lamps, mm. perfume, food, and music. Mm. So they transform into those, but you think they're clear, unobstructive, and as extensive as space. Mm -hmm. So in front of you is just your tiny little, you know, altar, but you're visualizing that it multiplies and multiplies and multiplies and feel, fills your whole field of vision. Yeah, that your whole mind's eye is flooded with offerings, mm. just really abundant. And you're not thinking of them as, ordinary or judging them like you know that flower petal is wilted that's not a good offering you're not getting all superstitious you're not getting neurotic you're just thinking beauty fills all of space and it's there and so when you see om agyam ahum it's this visualization above is happening with agyam water for drinking so this is the blessing part so these are guys are just appearing later you're going to actually offer them yeah. So Om Pajam Ahum, that visualization is happening for water for washing. Om Pupe Ahum for for flowers, etc. Sure. Yeah. There's a question. Hopefully they can hear me. So the um, usually I say Om Ahum, but not the middle. You say Om Ahum like when you're filling water bowls. Yeah. That's fine. That's good. It's okay. The, um, this is the difference between sadhana practice and just your regular oh. offering altar setup. Oh, okay, okay. So when you're, you know, filling your water bowls, you go om ahum, om ahum, om ahum, om ahum, om ahum, om ahum. Yeah, om ahum, the enlightened body, speech, mind. Um, that's your just normal daily practice, om ahuming. <laughs> yes, <laughs> which will never go out of style. And it's making those beautiful <laughs> offerings, you know, again, clear, purified, expansive as space, oceans of uncontaminated nectar, all the beautiful things done, right? Just very quickly, right? You don't even have to think about it that hard. But when you actually do the sadhana, now you're thinking particularly these substances. Uh -huh. So okay. if you're just doing water, it's like oceans of uncontaminated nectar that you offer to all gurus, Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Yeah, beautiful, nice. When you're doing the sadhana, you're thinking those particular substances and those particular substances were, of course, the historical things you would offer to a VIP in ancient India. 
Yeah, when someone really important would come to your house, you would give them water, you would wash their feet, you'd offer them flowers, you know, you'd offer perfume and incense in front of them, beautiful lights would be all around, there would be a feast, there would be music, you'd really pull out all the stops for an important person coming to your house in ancient India. We're inviting an important Buddha to our practice here and now. But those surface understandings of those sense offerings, which again are things we're transforming our attachment to as well, those surface level, really the Buddhas want your practice. Yeah, and so they each represent a type of practice. Mm -hmm. And so more on that later if we have time, but um, those, you know, don't get too literal, basically. Don't get too literal, but those are the reasons for those ones. Okay, so we'll have a little half hour break and then we'll come back at um, 11 o'clock Pacific time and um, do the sadhana. Thanks.